first presentation, receive a presentation from Stanford University and the district's hydrogeologist on the preliminary results of the Airborne Electromagnetic Survey of the Smith Valley. Staff? Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. So the district, as a state-designated groundwater sustainability agency, is involved in many efforts to protect the water that we have today as well as prepare for the future. Some of those efforts are our Ruap Recycle Water Project, our Armstrong Ranch Surface Water Project that we're looking at, and also additional studies to look at the groundwater to make sure that we understand it as best we can for making decisions about projects in the future. And so with that, uh, in May of 2015, the district's hydrogeologist, when looking at the Monterey Peninsula Water Supply Project data from the monitoring wells, had uh, identified fresh water in the areas around Marina and Ord. And so we wanted to look at that further and to see what tools were available to us to then explore that and get a better understanding of that. And so we were able to partner with Stanford University and utilize a tool that's called airborne electromagnetics, the geophysical method that allows us to look into the aquifers down to a depth of about a thousand feet. And so in May of this last year, we used the equipment on the helicopter of what's shown in that picture there, and Ian will go into that a little bit more. But we use that equipment to fly the area around the district, um, even as far north as Moss Landing, and gather this information. And so over the last few months, we've been going through the information, we've been ground truthing it to our wells, and really getting it prepared for a preliminary release. So tonight is our first opportunity to share that information with the public. And so we're pleased to have both Ian Gottschalk and Curtis Hopkins here tonight to go over that. And so what we would ask also is that we save questions for when those presentations are complete. Um, but with that, I would, I would like to first introduce Ian, who's with Stanford, and Ian will uh, begin the presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Where's good to stand? I think you have a microphone there. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Ian Gottschalk. Um, I'm a PhD student at Stanford University in the Geophysics Department. I'm working with Rosemary Knight, um, some of you may know. This a little bit better for everyone. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it is on. Yeah, everyone. Closer? A little bit closer. Okay, right there. Yeah. Um, so, perhaps three months ago in mid May, uh, if any of you were walking around Marina, you may have looked up into the sky and seen something that looks a little bit like this uh, a helicopter flying through the city along with what appears to be a generator hanging down from that helicopter and an extremely large hexagonal frame uh, that's coming down even below that, about an elevation of uh, 100 feet off the ground surface. So that was a project that was spearheaded by the Marine Coast Water District uh, in partnership with Stanford University and uh, consultants at Copper Geo Frameworks out of Mitchell, Nebraska. And so I wanted to explain a little bit more to you about why that helicopter was flying around in the marina area, what exactly it was doing, what it was measuring, and then finally, what we've learned from that data since we've collected it. So as I said, the project was spearheaded by Marina Coast Water District in partnership with, uh, with us at Stanford. Um, and really the goal of this project, uh, the aim of it was sustainability and management of groundwater resources. Groundwater resources are uh, a precious uh, resource that we have in the marina area, especially on the coast that we want to be able to sustain and be able to maintain into the future. Uh, it's incredibly important that we know exactly what lies beneath our feet and uh, how the different interactions of, of water and the ground um, play in with uh, the different forces that we put on the environment, such as uh, pumping, um, along with different environmental factors, drought years and wet years, and how do all these things play out. It's extremely important um, in order to preserve the groundwater resources that we have um, to know exactly what is going on in that subsurface where the water lies. A large part of understanding and rationale for understanding what lies beneath our feet is uh, 
due to a process called saltwater intrusion, uh, which you may have heard of before. It's a process which affects almost every coastal community across the world, and marine is no exception. Now, saltwater intrusion happens, as you can see in the diagram here at the top, when a body of salt water, generally the ocean or a lagoon, uh, comes in contact with terrestrial aquifers, which are uh, they, which contain fresher water. Now, the pressure between the ocean water and that fresh water that's terrestrial um, set up a, an equilibrium point, and there's a, an interface that you can see on the cross section of the right hand side of the screen. Now, that interface is the point at which those two pressures are equal, and it's a relatively delicate balance, or at least it can be in certain situations. So different forcings, different uh, effects that we can have on either side of that picture, either on the sea level side or on the terrestrial side, can move that boundary either landward or seaward. So again, it just reiterates the point that we, uh, it's very uh, important for us to know what exactly lies beneath our feet um, and uh, what the interplay are, for example, between different aquifers uh, in the systems beneath our feet that we can uh, learn to manage and protect these front of all the resources that we have. So how do we learn about what lies underneath our feet? Right here, uh, I have shown on the screen a simple conceptual block model of what the subsurface might look like. Um, this is an idealistic section, and what you're seeing here and all these arrows that are pointing up and down and around are different parts of what we call the hydrological cycle. Those are different interactions between the atmosphere, the ground surface, and the ground as they pertain to the water cycle. Um, and all of these interactions are at play at any given time um, in our landscapes. And while this might seem like a relatively complex section, uh, it's actually a little bit simpler than what we have here in Marina because we have the added uh, complexity of the saltwater intrusion that we just talked about before, uh, which is not uh, displayed here. So we really, uh, if we'd like to know what lies underneath our feet, um, traditionally, the answer to that question is, well, we drill a well. And wells are incredibly useful. <coughs> this uh, red cylinder that I uh, pop up here on the screen. Wells are incredibly useful because they give us a large amount of information about the ground in that area that we drill. As you drill down, sediment comes up to the surface through the honoring bit and you can learn about what kind of sediment is it coarse, is it like gravel, is it easy to go for water to flow through that, or is it very fine and uh, plastic to play, and is it difficult for water to flow through. Um, you can take samples on the water quality. You can, um, once you install a well, you can pump water out of it and see how the aquifer reacts. There are many things that you can learn through a well, but if you'll notice, um, it's very dependent on where you actually place that well. It's that one, one dimensional point. So if we had placed that well somewhere else in the aquifer, perhaps we would have learned a completely really different story. And so the follow-up answer, perhaps, um, traditionally speaking at least, to how do we learn about what lies beneath our feet, is you can drill more wells. Um, you can continue to drill wells and, uh, in hopes of learning more about the aquifer system. Um, this can be extremely time-consuming as well as very expensive. Uh, you do learn information, but at the end of the day, Oftentimes, uh, hydrologists are left connecting the dots between those different discrete measurements and trying to fill in the gaps. Um, it's not always a very easily understood story, and especially in complex scenarios like we have here in Marina, it can be difficult to decipher, even when you have all those wells that are drilled. So as I told you before at the beginning of this talk that I come from, the Department of Geophysics at Stanford. And so you might be able to anticipate what I'm going to say is a good answer to our problem to help us understand what lies beneath. And indeed, I'm going to say it's geophysics. So uh, geophysics is really just a, uh, the, using physical methods and means to probe the Earth. So it's using things like electricity, magnetism, seismic waves uh, to understand what exactly is, is inside the Earth. And we can use those, uh, it, we can use those methods as well as those properties um, to get a more continuous picture of what is the meaning of the We've already actually been involved in this, Stanford University has, in the modern day area. Um, in 2014, um, a group at Stanford, including my advisor Rosemary Dyer, um, came out to the Monterey Bay and uh, conducted a, um, a program.
profile using a method called electrical resistivity photography um, to understand more about the electrical conductivity underneath the ground right along the shore. So I'll show you some zoom, uh, zoomed up profiles of what that data looked like um, from a recently new published article out of our group. Um, and it, where this shows the, the resistivity of what was below the ground along the coast, where red is much more conductive or less resistive, and that corresponds to saltwater intruded regions. The far blue side of the spectrum, which is the most resistive, corresponds to freshwater saturated material. And as you can see here, just a few points of wells um, could never predict this interplay uh, complexity uh, as you travel north or south across the Monterey Bay. Um, you can see different interplays, in, in, even within the same uh, vertical section, the same aquifer, that there are some regions which are saltwater intruded and other regions which are relatively fresh right on the coast. So this, again, reiterates the point that we, uh, we need to understand more about what's going on in the subsurface if we're going to be able to accurately manage our water resources going into the future. So this was a fantastic study that we did in 2014, collected an incredible um, amount of data, uh, and it's still giving us answers to questions that we have. Now, there are also two-dimensional slices that are going along the coast. And so naturally, what we wanted to do as we're moving forward into this. Quick question, which subsurface lava area is this? Which? Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, this is uh, going down to a depth of 300 meters, so 1,000 feet as well. <coughs> so uh, naturally what we wanted to do is, now that we already have this data, is to take that two-dimensional data and expand it into the third dimension and move it inland so that we can get a more comprehensive view of what's going on, not just at the, um, at the interface between the, uh, between the ground and the ocean, but what's actually moving farther inland. And so that's where airborne electromagnetics comes in. What we've decided to do is to take our geophysical equipment, mount it onto a helicopter, and fly it around. These are just a couple stats about the airborne electromagnetic system. It's flying about, uh, the, that hexagonal frame is flying about 100 feet above the ground surface. It's going up to 50 miles an hour, meanwhile uh, collecting data continuously. And it's imaging down to 200, up to 300 meters, so 650 to 1,000 feet, depending on the conditions and how favorable they are. Now, um, uh, like I said, depending on how the conditions are and how favorable they are, um, there are some conditions that um, make the, uh, the measurement a little bit less favorable, such as um, uh, clay units or um, uh, or some other um, some other features but we're still able to resolve this down to 650 feet or 600 feet. Um, so it's, uh, we're, we're still getting to extremely deep elevations, even in the least favorable situation. So this is our answer to, to the question of what lies beneath the feet. And we've talked about why exactly we did that. So now I'd like to go a little bit into depth of what's going on inside, that, inside the hexagonal loop as we're collecting data. What is what we're actually measuring? So here I'm showing you a generic slice of the earth vertically, above which um, are little trees planted on the right hand side, and a helicopter so flying with um, our what is called the induction loop hanging beneath it. So what we have this is a, a transmitting induction loop, um, and we have a generator which is hanging down below the helicopter um, and above the hoop, uh, which isn't so easy to see in this cartoon, but I'm sure you can imagine it. Um, and what, what we do when we collect a measurement is we use that generator to send a current through the loop, through this, um, this transmitter loop. And once the current becomes, it's, it's quite a strong current, once the current becomes strong enough, we suddenly cut off the current. So here we have the current flowing around the transmitter loop. And once it's strong enough, we cut off the current. And what happens when you cut off an, electromagn or an electrical current very quickly is it, it generates temporarily a magnetic field, a 
essentially a pulse magnetic field that, uh, that moves and propagates into the subsurface. Now when that happens, essentially what we do is we sit and we wait for a response because the same process happens in the earth. That magnetic field propagates into the ground, it creates its own little er, um, electrical currents in the subsurface, which in return create more magnetic fields, and we receive those, we receive that information as, as a, um, a pulse echo, you can imagine. That. The reason why this is effective and that it works is that those currents that are created in the subsurface are strongly related to the electrical conductivity of the subsurface. So when we receive our echo back, the strength of that echo um, is closely tied to the electrical conductivity. So we then, from those data that we collect from one pulse, we get a whole slew of, um, of measurements back, which correspond to different depths, and we can work backwards to solve for what the electrical conductivity is at those different depths. So then we end up with the same measurement that we did in our 2014 study, which is a uh, measure of electrical resistivity um, or conductivity, those two are um, uh, inverses of each other. And uh, then we can plot them out in three dimensions as our helicopter is flying through the same cloud. So it's very exciting. And now actually we talk about why exactly we flew this helicopter, what is happening inside this loop uh, as the helicopter is flying around and taking measurements. So now we can get to the exciting part and actually look at a little bit of the data. Right here, this is an example of what I'll be showing you. Um, these are resistivity profiles. So each one of these vertical stripes corresponds to one of the, excuse me, one of the measurements which is being made by the helicopter airborne electromagnetic system. Uh, so as you can see, these are vertical profiles, um, and they have a, an especially high resolution at the top. Um, and we'll plot things in the same way that we did with the electrical resistivity tomography data with resistivity that the bluest of colors corresponds to freshwater saturated sediments, which is the most resistive. Um, and the least resistive are the red colors, which correspond to saltwater saturated sediments. You'll kind of see that we start to uh, we start to see connections and trends and layering. And it's, um, it's exciting to, to see the colors in between um, the, the reddest and the bluest, that, that gradation between, uh, that all has information on the subsurface. It has information on the, the water quality, how, um, how saline that water is, as well as um, the sediment type, so how the, what size the particles are, um, and how much clay do they have inside them. Those all give information on the electrical conductivity. Now we can look at a profile of the data that we measure. Up in the right, top right hand corner of this image is a map view of the cross section that we're looking at. So as you can see, it runs roughly perpendicular to the shore, um, with A being toward the west from the ocean, with B uh, farther inland from the east. Now in the cross section itself, You'll see there's a uh, brown line here at the top, which represents the topography. Um, and I've marked out a couple of the lands, or a couple of the geographical landmarks here: the ocean, marina, the Salinas River. Um, I'm not a resident, so I wasn't exactly sure how far up this one extends, but I think you can get the picture that, uh, of where we are exactly. And now, along with this topography, I've I've uh, plotted three different wells in which we have resistivity measurements. Now those resistivity measurements were taken in the wells themselves. So um, <coughs> those were data that were collected in 2015, um, and it's a, a fantastic way for us to check our data, to make sure that our data makes sense. Because those were taken completely independently of the study, um, we would like to see if our data correlate with what all exists. Then we can know that what we were measuring in the helicopter 100 feet off the ground actually corresponds to reality. One caveat that um, these wells were logged in 2015, so you can expect some small changes. Things change over time, but the general trends we're hoping will remain the same. Now, from these three wells, as we can see, we understand the data was recorded in 2015, 
And you can see some trends. There's some saltwater saturated sediment here uh, toward the northwest, closer to the ocean, as one might expect. Farther um, inland, you see a little blend of fresh water uh, as well as salt water that's farther down. But we end up with the same problem of trying to interpolate between those blends. What's the story in between? Uh, and what kind of connected dots can we actually play to to really get at uh, what's going on in the be? And so now we can expand this image significantly and learn a great deal with the airborne electromagnetics. So this really fills in the picture as I think the data really speak for themselves. We see that we had good agreement with the wells that were in place uh, from 2015. Um, but we see so much more beyond that. Uh, we're seeing that this, this fresh water that was here that we saw as just a pocket is actually quite an extensive amount of fresh water that, uh, that tracks inland. Um, not only that, but there's actually fresh water higher than was reported in the wells. Now, uh, I, I forgot to mention this earlier. Um, these wells with resistivity measurements in them, they have some uh, black shading at the top, and that's just where the, the measurements were not taken. That's just part of the well, but they, they are measurements. So um, these, uh, these data really show us also about the saltwater intrusion that's happening in this area. We see a very nice geometry that we never could have really uh, predicted before without um, a significant amount of data. This is encouraging, very exciting, and I can tell you that uh, this is what saltwater intrusion looks like if you open up the textbook. So uh, we're very excited to see this data come out when we measure the uh, you know magnetic fields that were induced in the ground. It's, um, it's quite it's quite something. But I'd like to show you one more profile really quickly, and I appreciate your attention. Um, but before that, I'm sorry. Uh, there's one more thing that we can do is uh, just as we're starting to play with this data, we can use mathematical uh, interpolation. Um, to bridge the gap even between our measurements, which are already relatively dense, and uh, give an image which is a little bit easier on the eye. Uh, and using those mathematical manipulations, we can also apply cutoffs at the places where we know, okay, below this resistivity, it has to be saltwater saturated. Or above this resistivity, we know that the sediment must be <coughs> freshwater saturated. These are conservative estimates, and um, we can use those cutoffs to uh, get very nice features um, and, and really start to understand the geometry of this. Now I'll do one more profile that I'd like to show. This time we're parallel more or less to the Monterey Bay. Um, a is for the north and B is for the south. Uh, as you can see up here we have the Slingus River just crossing right about here on the map here. And then uh, Marina is totally south. Now again, we have uh, the same issue of uh, trying to understand what happens between our discrete well measurements. The AEM data really fills in those gaps. Notice we still do have some gaps, and that's largely due to infrastructure. So the helicopter didn't ever fly over uh, any buildings, it didn't fly over the city of Marina um, due to FAA regulations as well as just general safety. Um, so we do, uh, as well as power lines are a source of noise where we have to cut out our data because um, the, uh, the coupling electromagnetically from those power lines doesn't allow us to actually receive any good data out of that. Um, so what we're left with is, is the good data which is filling in all these gaps. Again, you can see this incredible correlation between what, we, what was measured in wells in 2015 um, and what we're measuring here with the airborne electrons. One more thing that I'll plot on here is uh, some lithologies, some sediments from wells in the area. And for simplicity's sake, I group them, group these wells into a binary classification where either those sediments that were drilled in the well were, uh, were clay bearing, they had clay in them, uh, which are plotted in blue here, or uh, those sediments which do not have any clay in them more like sands and gravels, things where, uh, where water finds it easy to flow through, and those are generally our aquifer materials, and those are plotted in yellow. 
And we can already see, um, for example, if you look on the left-hand side of the profile, just below the Salinas River, we see that uh, this lens of saltwater intrusion, this red, corresponds perfectly with the, uh, the non clay bearing materials, the area where we would expect water to flow easily. This makes a lot of sense because if we expect saltwater intrusion to happen, um, it's going to happen um, in the areas where it's easiest to flow first. Uh, it'll go with the passive path of least resistance, and that's exactly this path here. So again, we can use our mathematical interpolation to get a little bit more of an easy to understand picture and see what the geometry is, how the interplay between these, these different forces are happening. So it's really an exciting thing. Um, we are getting started on this data and working with it and understanding it. And there's so much more that it has to offer. And a little bit of something that I'd like to show you is a quick two minute video. Which will show us the data in action. So here in orange, I'm going to talk about here in orange, I have plotted uh, the contour of the 180 foot aquifer, salt water intruded region, and that's um, from the contour maps which are released by the Monterey County Water Resources Agency. And so that's just for reference, um, as a reference point for you to put C in the movie go down. So as we're here in Marina, we're, we're tipping the earth so that we can see underneath it. And we're going to be able to see these 2014 electrical resistivity profiles that we took. Again, to emphasize all the information that we already had about the subsurface, but those were in two dimensions. So now, what we're trying to do is expand this into the third dimension, and all these lines here are the airborne electromagnetic lines where we flew. We're now shading them corresponding to the resistivity that they are. Blue is a higher resistivity, and reds are lower resistivity. Now we can look at the data in three dimensions. As you see, we're tilting the Earth, and now we're getting to see the expansive amount of data that we collected. Wow. <laughs> so you can see just the, the heterogeneity, uh, the, the, the differences in different areas. There's a very, uh, what we say, a heterogeneous area. Um, one is not like the other. And it's so important that we've collected this data just so that we can show um, and understand and see what's going on in different areas because one rule will not apply in one area as it does to another. So another thing we can do with data is we can, we can slice it. And once we take slices of it, we can also march through it and look at different profiles. We can interpolate the data. As you can see here, we turn it into a continuous block. And now we're moving north, slowly moving north. As you can see, the profile is changing. And you can see how the conditions change, how the saltwater intrusion um, is not uh, not so far inland, but starts to grow and grow and grow in different areas. So you realize every area is a little bit different. So it's really been an extremely exciting project, and uh, is actually just shaping up to continue to be a very exciting project. Um, so we're excited to work with. Uh, Marina Coast Water District um, and Aqua Geo Frameworks on this to continue to process the data, um, work with um, Marina Coast to learn more about saltwater intrusion and to, to predict it and to it in the future. So, uh, with that, I think I'll leave you and thanks so much again. Very good. Anybody have any questions or? Oh, Just we'll take questions after Curtis wants to follow that up now. So I'd like to introduce uh, Curtis Hopkins from Hopkins Groundwater Consulting.
that we do have saltwater wedge. Uh, we, we, we've known that, but what's of interest here is here's the location of the river um, as we come off the dunes into the main portion of the basin. Um, and uh, again, we can see this green layer, which is an aquapark. Uh, it, there's a semi-perched layer of uh, water on top of that, as well as you can see the freshwater layer underneath it. Um, so uh, here's a, a, uh, that, that same profile, but extending further inland. So it starts over here at the coast and goes across the river here and includes the Armstrong Ranch property owned by the district. And so we can see that under the Armstrong Ranch property, it's primarily freshwater in the upper zones, and then we have seawater intruded zones beneath that. Um, but what's of interest here is that we believe we have good communication uh, between the Dune Sand Aquifer and the 180 uh, along the coast, and this recharge that occurs from water, either direct infiltration of rainwater on top of it, or stormwater basins that recharge into the aquifer system, um, that it is uh, creating, uh, if you would, uh, protective conditions where uh, the heads along the coast are helping slow, if not abate, seawater intrusion, at least in the shallower zones. Also, what we think we see here, again, these layers are not directly continuous. There's an offset here. Uh, that what we see right here at the river is that we think we have recharge that's also uh, being, uh, if you would, recharging the underlying 18400 that's north of the river. Um, and so we see fresh water, uh, potentially saline water or brackish water, if you would. And this may be representative of um, climatic cycles, where when it was a wetter period of time, the amount of recharge that came in through here help uh, hold seawater back, and then as we have droughts, seawater marches in, etc. Um, we just required this data, so uh, I think it raises as many questions as it answers, but at the same time, it's an excellent picture um, as what we have um, under the ground. Um, here's a profile uh, within um, a couple hundred feet of the coast, uh, and you can see uh, fairly uniform, as you would expect, salt water in the shallower zones along the coast. Stepping in just another couple hundred feet, um, you can see that we have substantial um, fresh water that's developing or appearing in the shallower zones and even uh, the 180 as we move uh, towards the four board area. Um, and then stepping a little farther inland, um, again, the fresh water uh, lens is still on top of the underlying brackish uh, brown water. Uh, another look uh, through the Armstrong Ranch area, uh, which uh, here's a monitoring well five and six, and here's five and six along the farm ranches approximately in this area. And it shows the same type of um, uh, information that we saw from the uh, slice that was perpendicular to the coast. Um, so as, as Ian had pointed out, the data and the tools that are available to uh, review the data and evaluate the data allow us to draw profiles. And so here um, we looked at one that was just um, within 200 feet of the coastline, and then we stepped at 200, 200 foot increments away from the coastline. So what we see is primarily uh, seawater and the location of the cement plant operations. And it kind of appears as a mound right here. And then by the time we get 400 feet away, you can see it beginning to, the mound is diminishing. We begin to have more fresh water in the shallow zone. Um, and then as we continue moving uh, inland away from the coast, uh, again, that fresh water zone uh, within a thousand feet continues to develop. So the uh, airborne electromagnetic data um, uh, it, uh, has implications for a, a review or evaluation of the proposed project by CalAM. Uh, the CMEX um, site has, uh, if you would, a local influence on groundwater, and that influence is recharging seawater at the surface uh, from dredge um, pond mining operations and wash water ponds that are used to 
um, return the, the water uh, for disposal. Um, the uh, groundwater, the, there's a substantial fresh groundwater that exists in the dune sand aquifer and the upper 180 foot aquifer as we move away from the site, both inland and up uh, or down the coast from that location. Um, and that the seawater intrusion is not ubiquitous in all zones uh, along the coast there, but it's um, uh, definitely fully intruded in a very narrow band along the coast. Uh, these findings indicate that um, there's a greater amount of fresh water that will likely be produced by that project just by its presence in an area that we thought was almost fully intruded with seawater. Um, at this uh, location, however, uh, as you can see by the saltwater wedge, the 400-foot aquifer is probably the most intruded uh, aquifer zone um, in this section of the coastline. Um, and then model construction uh, south of the river, uh, very few data were available when the regional groundwater model was constructed. And so it, it had difficulty and, and was, you know, uh, well stated in their study, uh, but the difficulty is uh, not having the availability of data, including wells in this area. And so trying to fill that in with multiple wells would be a very expensive uh, endeavor. And so uh, fortunately we have a study that helps us see it uh, in great definition um, and by correlating with the existing wells that have been put in. Um, this, this is the CMEX plant, and so I wanted to describe uh, what I was saying about uh, the effects of the CMEX operation. You have the test slant well that starts here and goes down uh, uh, to almost 200 feet thereabouts as it approaches the shoreline. Um, what is occurring is they use a hydraulic dredge where they have a barge that uh, pumps water up over the dunes through a pipe, a flexible pipe, that then discharges up here and flows down the back side. This allows them to take their equipment and go mine that material, bring the material to the plant without going through the dunes to a, sens it's a sensitive habitat. So um, the dredge pond itself allows seawater to infiltrate and move over the ground surface without impedance through the semi-permeable materials, sand if you would, the sand dunes, towards the, the well, so it, it supplies saline water. Well, um, this wash pond and this wash pond both receive water, um, and their wells are completed in the 400-foot zone, which we can see was, was very intruded. So again, here we have um, a facility that if we put it down here, wouldn't have this influence. Um, here's a, a picture of the, the, the uh, rich barge. With on the bottom, uh, this this wall just caved in. Um, on the bottom of the pond here, they're they're sucking in water, and with it, the sediment that they carry over the hill through this pipe, and then on the back side of the dunes, discharge seawater. So here's a um, out of their long-term monitoring reports. They provide various data for the Monterey Peninsula Water Supply Project, and this is the test slant well conductivity. Conductivity is directly related to the amount of salts that are in the water. So seawater is very conductive, um, and fresh water then would be low conductivity. Well, what we're seeing in the data, we're trying to understand um, why it's fluctuated, um, and in particular, uh, it, it, it's risen during certain time periods which appear to correlate with their dredging operations. So when the dredging operations are off, um, uh, and you can see through the winter here, we had decent rains and the dredge was off, uh, it, the conductivity declined. And so what we're seeing again is uh, what we believe is uh, in man-made influence at this specific location. Uh, what would you expect now, since they just started um, dredging again, we would expect this to start climbing again, so we'll see what happens. Um, on a, a regional uh, basis, um, issues that we have observed through the geophysical data uh, is that the freshwater recharge has been significant in this area of the 180, 400 foot uh, sub-basin and it provides a protective groundwater level for the shallower aquifer zones. 
if you would, two and a half feet of water above the sea level um, would prevent saltwater intrusion based on the density down to a depth of 100 feet. So if we have 10 feet of water above sea level, fresh water onshore above sea level, it would protect down to 400 feet. So this is what we look at, what kind of conditions we have and how protective is it. Um, and uh, here we also see the freshwater influence has reduced the landward groundwater gradient, uh, and I'll show you here in a minute a graph of this, uh, within the North Marina area portion of base and south of the river. Um, oh, and we believe that uh, the data show that uh, the reduced onshore gradient uh, from the uh, pumping prohibition has uh, been enhanced by this uh, local, if you would, localized phenomena of recharge um, in this portion of the coastal. So this is uh, some of the, uh, the test well um, monitoring wells and uh, the, um, the green is indicative of uh, what the water levels were. Um, the solid line was in May of 2016 and the dash is February of 2017. Um, and what we see in the shallow aquifer are heads that are almost 10 feet, 9 feet here back in May of last year, but they rose to 18 feet during the peak of this spring season uh, when we had uh, enough precipitation. We had flow in the river. Um, so it was a good year. Uh, unfortunately, the couple of years preceding this uh, have been at the end of a drought. And so those conditions, uh, when we started seeing the data generated by the project, uh, were indicative of a dry period, and not a normal or an average period. Um, but what's important here is sea level. And so the green is the shallow dune sand, where the blue is the 180, and then the purple is the 400 foot aquifer. Um, if you would, uh, within two miles of the coast, this is monitoring wall number five and then monitoring wall number six. So all these wells within two miles of the coast show what is a relatively flat gradient. So the groundwater movement onshore this direction is relatively slow until we get beyond what is, um, if you would, it's a change in the sediments and a change in the basin boundary here, um, where it steepens up and starts moving inland. So here is the area of concern, um, and again, the area where uh, the di district holds its uh, Armstrong Ranch property. Um, uh, to show what I was talking about inland, this is the monitoring well number six, and you can see um, for the first couple of years of uh, uh, testing, it was fairly flat. Well, again, well above sea level, eight, nine feet, etc. Uh, this year, because of flow in the river, finally, uh, we had a, a big spike, a big peak. Um, and looking at last year was more of an average year, but we're seeing that the troughs are climbing. And, um, and, and so we're trying to understand conditions that have been somewhat unobserved in this area because there were no uh, wells to collect data from. Um, as we move from that well towards the coast, this is monitoring well number seven, and uh, we can see during the first couple of years, um, it was suffering from depressed water levels from the, the drier years prior to that, but that in this last year, it's received substantial recharge and water levels moving up towards 10 feet above sea level. Um, and likewise, um, the 180 and 400 even are moving up towards sea level and are not 20 feet below sea level like they are on to well number six. Uh, again, stepping towards the coast even further, monitoring well four, um, uh, we're uh, beginning to collect data that are beginning to make sense of what we've seen in the geophysical survey. And so looking at that uh, freshwater saltwater interface, uh, MW4 is within a thousand feet of the coast. And what we can see is that um, uh, throughout the production of the well, again, we think that there was mounding from CMEX operations, but it has fallen from over 
10,000 microsiemens per centimeter, it's you know, conductivity unit of measurement, to below 5,000. And we believe this is that front moving towards the coast, both by probably induced by the pumping, but also pushed by the recharge that's occurring further inland. So um, we do have minor uh, water quality data. Uh, we received a set uh, on the uh, monitoring wells. And uh, what these, uh, these are step diagrams, what they show is chemical character of groundwater. And if you would, this is a sodium and chloride, uh, cation ion, cation, um, and sodium chloride is the composition of seawater. So it's fairly plain to see that these um, wells here along the coast have seawater. This, uh, this map here is in the dune sand aquifer. But when you start coming inland, you begin to see that uh, they definitely don't have a sodium chloride composition and they're fresher, fresh water. Um, uh, given that, that's again where we started our um, uh, inference of we have some anomalous occurrence here because Here's our 180 zone um, intrusion front, and, and yet in this area we're seeing these freshwater wells. And then you look at it and you go, well, there's a little more salt in it here than, than there are in these other wells. Yes, but not all salt is from the ocean. Um, we have a lot of land uses that contribute salt uh, from the soil uh, to the aquifers underlying it. Um, so it's important to understand the kind of character of the water, not just how salty it is. Um, this year, in fact, just recently here, a couple months back, the uh, Monterey County Water Resource Agency released uh, new maps and of importance here. These data went through 2015, and on the 180, it shows very little encroachment from its previous um, uh, estimate. But on the 400, it shows significant um, more uh, discovery, if you would, of, of seawater, salt water, inland. Now, I don't believe this is a boundary that's Reservation Road. <laughs> they just may not have data south of that. I'm not sure the, the reason for that configuration. But uh, this interests us, and so uh, we took this data, we overlaid both maps, and so what, you know, this 400 foot these islands here, and here's the 400 foot front, and then here's the 180 front. And so what does um, the data that Stanford generate show? Well, here's A to A prime, which is the upper section. And so what we see coming across here is that the 180 is intruded. Until we get about here, and the confining layer underneath of it is not affected. And so it allows the, the intruded salt water to start dropping down into the 400. This, we believe, correlates with this occurrence right here, which is like an island. So it's not moving horizontally in, it's moving vertically down from one aquifer to another. Uh, we think that may be this occurrence and this occurrence, you got this little island here, um, etc. So again, um, the information that we now have we think can be utilized in many ways especially for understanding how to manage a basin that's somewhat complex like this um, likewise down here is uh, b2b prime which is the shorter section here and again um, we see the, the newly um, mapped purple area in the 400 which i believe in, is uh, right in this area here so you can see how um, it, this was well known before, um, but uh, we're seeing uh, an intrusion, and again, what's the mechanism for that? Good question. Um, but we now have uh, the ability, to, the county now has information that they can use as well. Uh, to the district, what's important is these are your wells. The blue ones here are the deep wells. They're in the 900 foot aquifer. Um, and to this point, uh, there's been no intrusion map in that zone. However, um, Ian's data shows some very interesting uh, phenomena that may uh, change that picture in the future. Um, the yellow ones are uh, screened in the 18400, and then the red one is in the 400. So you can see um, the 400 
and the 180 front is nearing the wells that could be impacted by it. So it, it is a concern to the district what happens in this section of the coast. Um, and anybody have any questions or comments? Please come to the podium. You have four minutes. All right. See you simple question for Ian related we had uh, the resistivity graph that went from red to blue and it showed the uh, saline side at, at negative 0.5 ohms the, the red side and I was just wondering uh, what seawater is like what's the, you know, what's normal seawater resistivity so um, well I guess should I bring it Question. So uh, in those plots, I was uh, I was showing base ten log resistivity. So it wasn't exactly uh, resistivity itself, but the, uh, the logarithm. So um, the uh, the seawater intruded sediment that we are seeing, um, because it's both a, it's a factor of both the water quality as well as the sediment. Um, we're seeing all seawater intruded sediment was below three ohm meters. Um, which ends up being in, in log 10 scale ends up being 0.477. So, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, just the thing about this last map that shows the uh, uh, what do you call it, the front, you know, the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the uh, county map. Um, you know, my understanding of that map is that it's in the neighborhood, I guess this is a um, question for you, sure. that that's, a, um, that's, that's at a level, in order to get that boundary, it's at 500 milligrams of chlorine, Chlor and that seawater is in the neighborhood of 18,000 milligrams. So what we're looking at is the level of, of that boundary is a level of where water becomes undrinkable without treatment. Is that correct? Yeah, actually, um, 500 milligram per liter chloride concentration is a good indicator of um, seawater intrusion because at the front you have mixing occurring, and so it's not full seawater there. Um, but uh, given that, it, it, it does make it unusable. Um, and, and in fact, the basin plan. Uh, the regional board basin plan says that water up to 3,000 milligrams per liter total dissolved solids is considered a, a municipal designation of beneficial use because we can blend, we can treat, we can desolve brackish groundwater. Um, so to, to that extent, that's how these maps were created, you're correct. That's defining that front. Um, but the concentration within that area, we can see from Ian's data is highly variable. Yeah. So. Somehow I connected this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hi, thank you for that. Pre those presentations. Uh, this is Bruce Delgado. Um, in both presentations, there was a uh, a slide like this that showed the location of the Cenex locations, and you went 200 foot increments away from the coast and depicted in 3D where there's fresh and salt water. And my question is, uh, if you imagine the proposed slant well intake pipes as soda, like soda straws, is there a way to show the public where those intake um, pipes would be directly uh, taking water? And secondly, uh, would there be a way to depict what the, where the area of cones of depression would extend around those pipes. 
because it, it looks like right near the uh, coast, there's some fresh water, but I can't tell. It's so thin, I can't tell how close it is to where those intake pipes would be drawing water. And so I'll just, that's my question, is can we see sometime in the future the geographic proximity of the proposed slant well intake pipes and where the fresh water is and where the cones of depression would be? This is probably a good one. Um, the uh, test flat walls are located along the coast. Um, if you would, there's debate about how large the corner depression will be as to how well we understand the hydrogeology um, in this area of the basin, again, because of so few wells. Um, Here's the slice that's right along the shore, and then we start moving inland, and the location of the test slant well is here. Uh, the other wells are to be located, my understanding of the design is to be uh, down the coast from that. So while they're producing from the shallower sediments, which is about <coughs> 200 feet, uh, they will induce radial flow around them. So a component of that will be uh, pulling from the fresh water that is inland. And again, as we go inland not too far, it gets deeper. And you can see still above the 200 feet, but we'll be in the area of influence. And so um, our concern is that um, what we found as a unique area of recharge and potential protective conditions along the coast for this basin that the project could disrupt this and um, as well interfere with uh, plans that the district has for, for future projects. <coughs> Any more questions? Comments? Step up. I have a simple question. Since uh, Cal-Am's project was originally intended to draw water from under the sea, not under the land, but below the sea floor, is your tomography method capable of mapping water <coughs> under the sea? So it is. Um, and uh, for this project, we we're, uh, we're focused more on the terrestrial effect. Um, but it is possible to fly a helicopter over the ocean um, and collect data. Uh, when you have incredibly, incredibly conductive material, so salt water, you can't get too much more conductive than that uh, as far as uh, normal liquids that we find around. Um, your, your depth, what we call the depth of investigation is limited. Now, you get very good data, however, uh, you start to you reduce your depth of investigation somewhat. So when I was talking about favorable and un, uh, not so favorable conditions, um, that's an example of not so favorable conditions because the conductivity is so high. Um, it's difficult to go down to 300 meters. Um, it is possible, and we, we've done some modeling on this, um, and there's also been a project um, in, uh, in Sokol Creek uh, where they actually used airborne electromagnetics over the ocean. They got very good, very good results, so it, it certainly is possible. Um, and this is for Curtis. I mean, you heard that the CMEX operation is going to be shut down. What impact does that have on what you found so far? Um, <coughs> when the plant shuts down, what's going to change is the present um, mounding of, of salt water, as I was showing from their present operations. And so that, that will dissipate. And uh, this ocean uh, would movement of shallow fresh water towards the ocean will continue and uh, so that the, we anticipate the project can just produce more fresh water. Um, 
Because right now, the water quality data that are being generated are largely influenced by um, the man-made uh, influence service. Thank you. Next. Um, I'm Mark Del Piero. I'm here on behalf of the Agland Trust, the people who have the wells that nobody wants to talk about. Um, um, we have two wells that are not part of this survey, uh, that were not uh, listed on uh, the, the survey of operative wells by the Monterey County Water Resources Agency. And in fact, the existence of those wells, which are fully active and, and were designed for agricultural irrigation have been denied by the county repeatedly up until we turned them on um, and then put a video on. Um, the question that I, uh, first of all, let me make an offer uh, to your district. If uh, as part of their ongoing research, uh, they want to have access to the water chemistry from our wells, uh, we'll be happy to provide that information. Um, including the well logs, and including the baseline water quality data that we took back in 2007 uh, in anticipation of slant wells inducing seawater intrusion into um, the freshwater aquifers underneath our property. If you don't know where we are, do you? I think, you're up by the river? No. No? Okay. We're within, we're within a, um, a stone's throw of the test well that's located on the road right of way for scenics. We're the next door neighbors. We're on the we're on the ocean side of Highway One between the Cemex sand dunes and the highway. Gotcha. And we have two fully operational big ag wells that have been there for years and years and years. And we started getting seawater intrusion as soon as the site well um, went on. Our water quality data uh, demonstrated we have a problem. So I just wanted to indicate, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, um, you know I've been here before. Um, these guys actually, I think, sort of agree with what we've been telling everybody. If you pump the 180, you're going to pollute the 400. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the, all that information. Uh, I want to follow up on uh, Mr. Masuda's question in terms of the uh, dredge pond and the influence on um, the amount of seawater or fresh water that's in that uh, area. Um, I know there were comments made and during the EIR process raising questions about the dredge pond having some influence because it was, a, uh, it was an inland source of seawater that seemed to be um, uh, favoring the readings for higher salinity readings from that inland source. Uh, it seems to me that a comment was denied specifically within the EIR, and I'm wondering if what we're seeing here is evidence of that fact which contradicts the EIR statement. Is that, am I am making a fair interpretation of that? I would say that's fair, yes. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, I've got some money. I just wanted to uh, commend the board on taking the action of uh, uh, developing this data. Uh, I know it was an expense to the district and uh, may have gotten some flack for uh, this expenditure, but I think it shows uh, uh, foresight and real concern for uh, resources in our city, and I think uh, as a board you are to be commended for that. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? It's the mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll close the hearing then and we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Tom, you got something to say, Tom? Uh, I do have a few questions. Um, let's see. Uh, the monitoring wells that were built for the uh, slant test well, how many years did they operate before the slant test well was turned on? Seven weeks. Seven weeks. Yeah. Um, now my understanding is the slant test well is for the purposes of testing the impact of CMEX pumping 
compared to pre-pumping conditions. So is seven weeks of monitoring well data sufficient to characterize accurately what has been going on for years uh, in the aquifer area in the vicinity of the CMEX test well? And, and we would argue that it's very limited data. Um, the, the argument is around what you call background data. And so um, prior to the test well starting, the, the this well, MW7 wasn't even in when the test well <coughs> started pumping. So not all of them were even constructed at that time. But the nearest ones, one, three, and four, were constructed weeks before the test well started operating. The interesting thing about that is that they were all constructed towards the end of a drought, a dry period. And so we believe that the conditions in the aquifer um, show uh, depressed levels and um, what we would expect during a, the end of, towards the end of a drought, but not representative of um, all times. And so. Uh, it was fortunate, again, to see, especially inland here, how water levels went from 5 feet above sea level to 10 feet above sea level. Uh, and, and again, that well extends down to 80 feet, so it's in the dune sand. But it shows a protective head. And what we're seeing is between this well and MW4, and the geophysics anyway, where that water is percolating down into the 180 and recharging, how much of this occurs, uh, the data we have can't show us. And so we right. say it's a, a short, if non-existent right. background. So, so in my academic career, which includes a minor in physics at bachelor's level and a couple of degrees in applied mathematics, the courses I had uh, that dealt with design of experiments emphasized the fact that you must understand the baseline conditions before you apply the test uh, treatment to whatever it is. Otherwise, you're going to be unable to make appropriate conclusions based on the information you get out of the test. So you indicated that one thing that could be going on, or is likely going on, is that the operations of CMAX have increased the level of salinity that these slant wells are likely to get if 10 of them are uh, built, except by the time 10 of them are built, CMEX will be on its way out. So if that impact goes away, I think you indicated there's a good possibility that those 10 test wells, which I understand will cost multiple millions of dollars to build, will begin drawing a higher than predicted in the EIR percentage of fresh water. Do you think that's the case? I believe that would be the case, yes. So if the largest size, and I don't know that the largest size desalination project is built, they would need all 10 wells. The EIR indicated that they would need to draw something on the order of 27,000 acre feet of source water per year from the CMEX property. Um, my understanding is, let's say they begin drawing so much uh, fresh water, and just to make it easy, let's say it's half fresh, half seawater, so that's going to be uh, what, 13,500 acre feet of fresh water being drawn in. And don't they have an agreement to return all drawn in fresh water to Castroville? Mm -hmm. uh, they have an agreement to return a certain amount. Um, uh, they have an obligation to return fresh water that's produced. And we would argue, based on the geophysics, it's going to be produced from an area of the basin that um, has provided again, freshwater recharge and protection, and that um, it, it should be returned to that same area of the basin for those users who are going to be impacted by that project. Because you can clearly see the change in geology going on the other side of the river through the, the profiles that he even showed. Since, since all of the Marine Coast Service Area, which includes Central Marina and the York community, currently uses about 4,000 acre feet of groundwater a year, I rather doubt that Castroville has a need for 13,500 acre feet of bottled um, water each year. So I guess the question number one would be, where are they going to return the rest of that to the basin, or are they just going to build injection wells and pour it into the basin? And I will point out for those who might be listening from the Cowan service area that should they hit a such a high level of potable uh, in their source wells, um, 
you are going to have to pay to desalinate all of that water and then only get, well in this case, less than half of uh, what you need. So actually if it's 50% seawater, they're going to have to pump more than 27,000 acre feet of source water to get the targeted 10,000 acre feet. And the Calium Service Area is going to be paying for all of that, uh, paying for pumping and desalinating 40,000 or so, or 50,000 acre feet of water, water, but only getting 10,000 acre feet. Um, so I don't know, but if I were in the Calium Service Area, I wouldn't exactly call that a wonderful financial deal. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Jen. Uh, first, let me just say uh, both presenters did a great job. Thank you for keeping the, the physics uh, simple and, and making, it, <laughs> making it possible for everybody here to try to get a picture of uh, what is under our feet. Um, I'm really glad as a water district that we were able to do this. And uh, I did notice among friends that I have from uh, the north side of the bay, there was some work done, so Kel, uh, I think was mentioned, and um, I'd like to hear about that more someday. And I wonder if both studies are going to be available on the Stanford website or the Water District's website, especially the awesome 3D modeling things that you started to show us. Is that going to be available? We'll certainly try to make available anything that we can as soon as we can. Okay, we'll and, and the, the district staff. Yeah, we'll make it available as soon as it's ready. And then as far as the Soquel Creek, uh, it's my understanding Stanford isn't the lead on that one, but they have been asked to look at it, so I'm not sure to what extent they'll have that available to them, so. Okay. Yeah, I think some people to the north saw the helicopter flying also. I didn't think we were studying that far, but I was curious about it. Um, the other uh, thought that I had, there's some... Um, quite a bit of difference between what the county produced in maps and uh, and what we're seeing here tonight. And either either of you want to sort of venture in theories about why the difference? Yeah, um, they have single points to draw data from. Um, yeah, two things, number one, again, those maps only uh, define where we see 500 milligram per liter chloride or greater. Mm -hmm. And they're only able to draw data from single point wells. And sure. this data um, is, is far more expensive and fills in the spots between wells. You can't tell exactly the water quality from that data, but again, uh, the, uh, the, it, it allows us to infer where we should investigate the water quality. Uh, you can sure, certainly tell where it's uh, red and where it's blue. <laughs> yeah, the imaging is fantastic. And, and my recollection on the cost is there was kind of a fraction of what I read that the county uh, paid in order to create those maps that we can see. I don't know about the county, but it's a fraction of what it would take to drill a dozen wells. I think it's just amazing. <laughs> well, with the wells, all you can do is interpolate between them. Correct. You know, and then you miss anything that pinches out in between the wells. And it's very difficult. Right. If you get a fence diagram that's accurately showing like like your 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 data here is presented to the computer, only a computer could do it. I mean, we couldn't do it with the old fence diagram <laughs> by, by hand. And, and well put, because that's why this area here was mapped the way it is. Sure. Because they had walls around it that gave them data. Sure. And so, again, you can only... And then you infer between them, like you yeah. infer. Got it. So, thank you. Anyone else? Tom. Yep. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It wasn't quite. I mean, um, you can sit down. Now <laughs> <laughs> this might even be a question that it would be a little beyond the science. So, uh, but one of the things that I noticed in the draft EIR for the Monterey Peninsula Water Supply Project, they had a, a map of a Salinas Valley groundwater basin that extended out under the seafloor. And I thought that that was very interesting because I'm so used to looking at maps where the Salinas Valley groundwater basin stops at the shoreline. And um, so I know originally the slant test well was designed to go under the bay and everybody was sort of so, sold, sold the concept that it was going to be pumping water basically out of the bay. Um, 
it, at this point, all of us seem to be just talking about the fact that it's pumping out of the groundwater. And um, I would like to venture just a, a personal opinion that to me it appears that the slant test well is a total failure because it is not pumping out of the sea, it is pumping the groundwater, and that proposal for 10 more uh, appears to me simply to, to take groundwater. And so here's one question I have for the scientists. I mean, I feel like uh, our attorney, Masuda, and many other attorneys can argue groundwater rights forever, but um, from a scientific, uh, scientific point of view, this groundwater that is brackish or that is uh, some portion of seawater, scientists call that all groundwater. I would. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the fact that it, the source of recharge is from the ocean, to me, doesn't make it, again, the attorneys will talk differently, but it doesn't make it not groundwater. It's in our base. Um, if it's saline, uh, we have very limited use for it other than desalting. Um, so, if brackish groundwater desalters are uh, used throughout the state uh, to clean up uh, salts that aren't necessarily from the ocean. Uh, we, we have uh, salts in the groundwater, so, uh, and that's still groundwater. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Oh, okay. So, yeah, two, two other follow-up questions. Uh, one is a segue off of uh, uh, Director Shiner's question. So, okay, even if the water pumped out of the basin, east of the shoreline were 100% seawater, would it be usable by Marina Coast Water District for any purpose? If you desalinated it, yes. So it's usable water? Uh, again, um, because we have the technology to take the salts out of it, yes. <clears throat> Just want confirmation of that. Uh, and another follow-up question. I've heard a criticism of the aerial electromagnetics level that, quote, uh, it can't see through clay layers. So I mean, might as well get that out on the table and hear what our experts might have to say about that. Right. Um, so yeah, I've uh, certainly heard this concern multiple times. Uh, and it goes back to um, our more favorable or less favorable conditions. Um, Essentially, the, the conductivity of the ground um, can determine uh, how far down we can see. Now, it turns out with airborne electromagnetics um, that more conductive features actually are easier to resolve. We actually get better imaging capabilities of seeing something like salt water at depth or clay at depth. Now, if there's significantly uh, conductive material, um, then it, it starts to weaken the signal slightly. Uh, and so you can't necessarily see down 300 meters. Uh, you might see, if, if you notice some of the profiles that I put up and that Curtis put up, um, not every single one of the lines actually extended down to the exact same depth. And that's because we cut off the data as soon as it becomes, um, it has too high of a, a standard deviation. Um, essentially, uh, if, you, if you wiggle that, if you wiggle that um, measurement around a little bit and then try to recreate your model, how much would that deviate from the value that you actually started with? So when that standard deviation becomes too high, we know that we, we don't want to trust that data point, we cut it off. And so that's, uh, you'll see those effects in the data that we have that not every single, uh, not every measurement point is the same. Um, and that's a fact of life, but still the data that we keep is extremely high quality. Um, and it sees down to maybe 200 meters or 175 meters instead of 300 meters. So we're still seeing down to significant depths, I would say. And one other question that the public might be interested in. So with that helicopter flying with its array 100 feet over mostly ag lands at 50 miles an hour, it's pulsing and listening, pulsing and listening pretty rapidly. So roughly physically along the flight line, how far apart are your measurements? Are they every 200 feet, every 100 feet? Right, so um, actually what we do is we take um, a few rapid measurements in one location, um, and we don't have time to, to what we call stack that data, 
um, for a long time and take measurement, 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 and you know, ideally, if you can stack your data for a very long time, then your, your signal, the amount of signal that you receive becomes very high compared to the noise that you might get from um, ambient conditions or uh, your, your, uh, your measurement capabilities. Uh, so we, do, we are still able, because the measurements are so fast, we're talking about microseconds, that uh, we can still stack a fair number of these measurements um, group them together and, and have them be uh, one representative, one of those stripes that you saw, um, an inverted section as we call them. Now each one of those inverted sections is approximately 30 meters apart, so 100 feet or so from each other. Um, and then as you saw, uh, perhaps those flight lines, uh, you can see them tracking more or less northeast, southwest, uh, and each one of those flight lines is displaced about 200 to 300 meters apart from each other with some lines that connect those together. So as you're flying along, you are in a single pass, essentially getting the same data that you would get drilling a well every 100 feet into the ground. Now we are, we are collecting electrical resistivity data. What I will say about, um, about those wells, uh, they certainly have their place. Um, we trust them. Uh, we have the, the time and uh, luxury, the luxury of time to log those. Uh, so we can use them, again, as, as a basis to uh, compare the results that we get. And um, those ones that go down in boreholes are significantly, um, uh, they're very high resolution. You, know, you, can, you can log every half of a foot. Um, so it's great that you can get that, that detailed information, but you can also get uh, incredibly uh, spatial and continuous data from the airborne survey that you really cannot get from the boreholes. Thank you. And what the wells give you is, is an exact stratigraphy of the ground that you need to know to tell you then through these aerial mag surveys what you have underground and why. They won't tell you the aerial mag surveys for wells, but all right. Anything else for the board? Okay, this time we'll, we'll, we'll close this item. We'll take a recess for about five minutes. Yeah. Thank you very much. For coming.